Hello everyone, Gary here live at Learning Technologies where I was lucky enough to speak to some brilliant people from the world of L&D for 15 to 20 minutes each and you are about to watch or listen to one of these episodes now. If you like what you're hearing from our guests, just check the description, there's a link in there where you can connect with them. That's also where you'll find the link to the death of the LMS guide, a report which helps you build a skills first approach to L&D. So as always, any feedback or if you like this format, you can let me know on LinkedIn and otherwise enjoy the episode. Pleased to say I'm joined by David Callender, Head of Learning Design at Mint Interactive, uh, one of our Hanau Plus partners, but pleasure to have you join us today, David, to chat all things design and learning experiences that help people build skills, engage, have impact. But uh, first things first, are you enjoying learning tech? Has it been busy for you this year? Yeah, this is our first event uh, exhibiting okay. uh, learn tech. So it's been far bigger. We were at another trade event a few weeks ago, which was about the third the size of this. Yeah. So it's been really good. It's been nice to meet lots of new people, lots of our clients, lots of the people that we work with and collaborate with. So it's been really good. 100% agree. Networking has been my yeah. my big takeaway from this year because I actually yeah. know more people this year than last year. So exactly, you know, it's nice to it. see people outside of their bedrooms and offices from from home the neck down. Yeah, <laughs> most of the people haven't even seen me without a cap on my yeah, head. But yeah. That's usually my go-to yeah. midweek kind of look. But yeah, it's been good. Oh, nice. Uh, we're going to dive into sort of a first question around when you see companies create. Well, obviously, you create a lot of bespoke content. Work with a lot of companies and. I want to know if there are common challenges you see people facing when they're trying to make content that's engaging and has an impact. Yeah, often it starts from the ground up when we have uh, challenges with engaging with new content and new ideas. And that often starts with internal politics. So you've got marketing departments who will own the brand and they'll have a particular look and feel, colour, text, one way of always kind of doing the same thing. And often we'll come in and support and give maybe new ideas and that will clash internally from an L&D team to a, a marketing team to other people involved. So generally the biggest challenge that we find is internal politics. So it's great when a company comes to us and they've already agreed internally that what the boundaries are and they let us know about those boundaries and we can work with them. But yeah, sometimes it's difficult to push through those boundaries. Yeah, yeah. one parallel I see between marketing and L&D is often the sign-off process takes longer than the problem's relevance or yeah. the momentum or people's enthusiasm. So is that another thing you see? It's like, we're really excited to get this up and running and start helping people learn, but yeah. by the time we get all the sign off, the moment of need is gone or the enthusiasm is dead. Exactly, but that's often when people are acting quite reactive to a situation, and we do try and sort of push people to think ahead and not just think reactively. Yeah. Um, but with regards to the sign off, the, the list seems to be growing the more and more <laughs> we get into this sort of industry because everyone wants to have a look and have a touch and have a think and have a, an opinion. Yeah. So we do try when we are dealing with clients to keep it as small a group of necessary people. Yeah. Um, some external people that aren't familiar with the content because a fresh set of eyes can often open up new doors. Yeah. But yeah, it's the, the internal side of things for sign off and marketing generally look at it directly from a brand guidelines perspective. Whereas L&D, we kind of argue sometimes and say, this is internal, this is going to people internally, there's no brand damage potential by going to internal staff. You can be a little bit more free, a bit more fun with it, because externally the image of the business isn't being impacted by what you do internally. That's often the argument I'll push for people to have a think of. No, I agree. I think part of the process as well is like maybe if an L&D team's put on a bit of a project management hat, they'll go, who do I need to involve and when? Yes. What do I need them to be involved on? Yeah. And how can we avoid the objective and the subjective getting mixed up. Like I find this often when it, with anything, when there's internal sign off, it's what is objective feedback like? Fundamentally, this doesn't work versus what is yes. subjective? Well, I'm not entirely sure on this. I don't like this. That struggle. As well, I mean, we, we often get someone that'll have a quick comment, yeah. that not realizing that might take three days worth of back work yeah, yeah. to change that quick comment. Yeah. Um, and that's when you get people that aren't particularly developers or designers, and they under, don't understand the, the process and the time it takes to do something, which is, again, why we usually push for as solid a, a sign-off, yeah. an approval of, of templates before yeah. we do anything that takes a particular amount of time. But yeah, completely agree with that. Uh, empathize. If someone listening today is thinking, I'd love to make sure my learning content is really solving a problem for people or helping build a particular skill, you know, it's really specific, what would some of the advice you'd give them be? Research, um, constant research on the subject matter before you approach an L&D professional. Yeah. 
So you need to have that need. So L&D should always be there to serve a need. If the need is something that's quite reactive and it's happened quite quick, you need to understand why that wasn't foreseen in the first place so you can help prevent in the future. Look into what caused that initial problem and look at the industry that you work in, whether it be financials, whether it be you know, aviation, whatever industry you're in, look at other people and see if they've had similar issues and what solutions they found. Bring on board the right subject matter experts. So every sort of man and his dog thinks they know everything about everything sometimes. <laughs> We're actually looking for a subject matter expert, even if that means externally bringing on a consultant to look into a situation. Because from an L&D perspective, we can only fix something when we know what the problem was to start with. Because we look to learn from the issue and then tell them how to then best do it in the future. And without knowing exactly what happened, just telling them the right way of doing it will not potentially fix that, that, that future problem happening again. So yeah, definitely research is the key to giving a, a full solution and, a, and the right solution in an L&D perspective. No, I, I think what you're saying, they're all ties together, you know, we need to go out there and uh, one, truly understand the problem we're solving. Are we reacting? Are we yeah. being proactive? Two, what indicators have we got someone has solved that before internally? So do we have data on who closes the most deals, for example, who has the best response rate versus if I said to you in Slack channel, well, who's the best people to speak to about this? Mm -hmm. And you get the same name come back 10 times. That's also a real clear sign that that person can be involved. I mean, on, as an example of that, I've uh, recently worked with a client that has a 17,000 staff population in the UK alone, yeah. as well as multiple sites across the globe. They are so big, they do not know what goes on internally. Each team has an, an L&D department, never mind department have an L&D department. And they, the duality of the work that they do is constantly just repeating, repeating, paying the same amount of money for different companies to come in involved and really sort of narrowing that down to who handles L&D within the business and having that single point funnel to then get spread out below, the, below yeah. that, that single bottleneck really does help. Yeah, clarity and that helps cut that red tape. Who yes. do I actually need to go to and, and not muddy the water, I guess. Exactly. You obviously create a lot of bespoke content that I mentioned a minute ago. And Obviously, bespoke of, often we can correlate relevance or specificity to it. So, how important do you think it is that people have access to relevant content rather than just sifting through a whole sea of different resources that might not be immediately relevant or makes it hard for people to find the thing they do need? Yeah. So that starts with categorizing your your education pr proposal to, your, to to the staff population. That could be from mandatory training, so the must-haves to do, but then also additional skills upskilling, uh, continuous professional development, so that the nice to have skills. Once you've categorized those two down, it's then also a think of how do people get to that place? How do we handle advertisement? Mandatory training is great, I love, but when I look at the, the uptake rate on co content we create, if it's mandatory, it's great, the numbers are really high. Yeah. If it's optional, the numbers are considerably less. Yeah. So it's about that marketing piece, and this is when bringing in other departments in the business really helps. Mm. You've got a, if you have a marketing department, you've got a, an entire team of people there that know exactly how to get people to do things yeah. through marketing. Yeah. Bring them on board, talk to them about a pre-launch, yeah. about a, where it's going to be held. You have an LMS system, yeah. but how many people log into the LMS system every yeah. single day? Exactly. Yeah. You go there for it's to solve a need, or you're told to go there. Yeah. So think of a marketing strategy, whether that be email drops, whether that be creating better landing pages on your internal SharePoint and in your intranet, and having catalogues of data and what that might that person might get out of doing that course. So as much marketing as possible, because we'll never create training, hopefully that is pointless, but you've really got to sell the benefit for someone to take it on board, especially if it's not mandatory and it's an optional choice to do it. I think you hit the nail on the head there. We need to bring it to where people already are. We also need to sometimes think about creating friction where we don't need to create friction. Like, for example, if we have a Slack channel where we already share a bunch of useful yes. resources with us and everyone engages, we can see it. Yeah. It'd be fairly pointless trying to drag people out of that to create awareness. We could drop it in the yes. Slack channel and say, look, we're launching this this week. It will help you do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And then lean more into the marketing side of it, like you said, which is, what's the value proposition? And that kind of, I guess, leads to your earlier point about SMEs, but we often look at SMEs as people we can use to capture content, but not also as like partners we can lean on and say, well, the marketing team can help me amplify the message. The project management team could help the process be clearer. Do you yeah. see some of that as well? 
Yeah, and, and often when we are dealing with our external clients, we have lots of different people on one on one call. Uh, teams is a great thing, especially to bring people from all over the world uh, together all on one call at the same time. Um, but yeah, you do, you, you'll have project teams to marketing teams. Uh, even some of the larger organizations we deal with will have an internal design team that will just be there to design either products, uh, product packaging, digital marketing, L&D marketing, those type of companies will have a real share on the board. And then you'll have your SMEs involved as well, who all have their own opinions on how things look and feel and how they feel that they should learn it and how it should be learned by other people. And that's kind of where we, as external people, really do put our own a little bit as well, because we can kind of help cut through all of that and give a real expertise to what they want, put it all in one package and say, all right, we've heard all the opinions, this is how, from an instructional design perspective, it should be delivered in the best way, taking into account all the considerations. And I guess final sort of question for you, we often talk about the moment of need, or you know, almost 50% of learners want to learn at their point of need, when they're facing a the challenge. How can we kind of break down some of these barriers to make sure, you know, we've talked about how we get the right content in place, but people can actually find it when they face a challenge, and that has that spillover effect of when people find it and they can yeah. also apply it, positive feedback around their learning happens, doesn't it? So yeah, so when it comes to centralizing things and making, making more than that 50% that are just doing at need e-learning and try and get people to plan things in, since the sort of the, the idea of continuous professional developments came in place, and businesses are targeted on how much time we allow people to do, planning things in and having a, a calendar of events that people are visible to, and they can see what type of subject matter they're going to be learning in that week, in that month, in that quarter, and they can plan that in their own diaries, especially for the time. Um, the biggest sort of pitfall that people find, I think, from what I see, is the time to do optional learning. We're all employed to do a job, and that job would generally take up the full time that we're at work. Yeah. So trying to find time out of your busy day to do some e-learning is really important. So it needs to have support from the business to be able to give people that time. So here at Mint, we have at least two hours a week self-development time for each member of our team, and we really push for people to do that. We work it out individually what their ideas are that, that they want to develop in, and it doesn't always have to be something that's going to benefit the business. Yeah. And we'll make sure that they know where that resource is. Yeah. We'll plan it in the diaries for them with links in the, in the in the diary invite on there. And we'll catch up with them in their one the ones on how they found it. Can we improve it? Can we give you something better? How's it compared with the other resources that you've used externally? So, so it's planning ahead and making sure that the learning that people are doing, they're on board with it. You'll, all, you'll always learn better when you're interested in the subject matter. If you're being forced to learn something that you have no interest in, you'll do it, you'll go through the motions, you'll tick the box, but the retention of knowledge is gonna be so low. So making sure that you've got content available for the people that are interested in the type of learning that you provide. But also think about the accessibility side of it. And I don't just mean by how do they access it, yeah. but how is it actually delivered from an accessibility perspective. Yeah. Great focus has been drawn on accessibility over the last few years and how content is delivered in not just the contextual colour against text, the, the yeah. more traditional, you know, black against darker colours is invisible. It's actually about how it's delivered in the media types, auditory, yeah. the, the physical, the tangible sort of activities that you can do, but then also the audio-visual learners, yeah. the people who like to read materials. If you have a great course, but the person doesn't digest information on the spot, they like to read it. Yeah. Do you have a transcript that the person yeah. can download and read afterwards? So how can you help that learner learn better is a real big thought that businesses are, are slowly starting to, but really do need to put into their learning. It's a great observation because one thing we'll talk about until we're blue in the face is the context of where someone is when they're trying to learn. And you, you covered yes. off so much of it there, but you know, what, what environment I, am I in? How much time do I have to do this? Am I doing other things? You know, there's so many variables happening. Yes. That you, if you bring those together and at least consider them as you build a learning experience, you stand a far better chance of people being able to use it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, David, pleasure speaking with you and uh, really appreciate your time. If people want to know about Mint in more detail, I'll just put links in the description wherever people are watching or listening and they can uh, get in touch. Before you head off, I want to tell you about two very exciting things. Death of the LMS, your free guide to skills first L&D is now live. From the numbers that explain LD's current problems to lessons on how you can build a skills-led strategy, 
This is going to help you drive more impact through learning. You'll find the link right at the top of this episode's description. And just below that, a link to our new weekly walkthrough, where we show you how this can be done in practice and give you a tour of how now our learning experience platform that gets five times more engagement than a traditional LMS. So thanks for listening and we look forward to seeing you again for another episode of the podcast.